This is a video about the GCSE physics topic of resultant forces, which comes up in paper two of AQA GCSE physics or combined science. In this video, we're going to describe what is meant by a resultant force, look at how to calculate a resultant force from two parallel forces, look at how we can calculate a resultant force from two non-parallel forces by drawing parallelograms, and resolve one diagonal force into its horizontal and vertical components. Objects never have just one force acting on them, but trying to take account of all of the different forces can get pretty complicated, and often we don't really need to. Usually we're just interested in what is going to happen to the motion of an object. Is it going to change the way it moves or is it going to stay the same? And for that all we need is something called the resultant force. Resultant just means overall, and this really isn't a tricky concept. Imagine that you're trying to push a box to the right with a force of 100 newtons. And at the same time, your friend is trying to push it to the left with a force of 100 newtons. Those two forces balance each other out. And so actually, the box doesn't move at all. It's as if nobody was pushing it in the first place. So we can balance those two forces out and say that there's a resultant force of zero newtons. Now let's look at an example where the forces don't balance. This is a free body diagram, and it saves me from having to do my best artistic impression of things I really can't draw. The circle at the centre represents an object's centre of mass, and the arrows show the direction and magnitude of each force. Remember, forces are vectors, so they always have a magnitude, a size, which in this instance is shown by the length of the arrow, and also a direction. It's really important when you draw a free body diagram that your arrows actually touch the centre of mass. So in this instance, you're pushing the same box to the right with a force of 100 newtons, and your friend is pushing back, but only with a force of 60 newtons. You can sort of think of this as if the first 60 newtons of your force have been balanced out by your friend, and that leaves 40 newtons left over. So there's going to be a resultant force of 40 newtons, and the box is going to move in exactly the same way as if you'd only pushed it with 40 newtons to begin with. So where two forces are acting in a parallel direction, but they're going oppositely to each other, you subtract the forces to work out what the resultant force will be. Hopefully that made sense. We'll look at one more worked example and then there are four questions for you to have a go at. So in this worked example, we've got a force of 25 newtons to the left and 75 newtons to the right. These forces are parallel, but they're going in opposite directions. So to find out the resultant force, we need to take one away from the other. So 75 take away 25 is a resultant force of 50 newtons, and it's going to the right. Now pause the video and see if you can write down what the resultant force is for each of the next four questions. The difference between 110 and 20 is 90 newtons, and the bigger force is on the right. So our resultant force is 90 newtons to the right. The difference between 50 and 60 is 10, so 10 newtons to the right. The difference between 70 and 30 is 40, so 40 newtons to the right. And then for our last one, the bigger force is on the left, and the difference is 70, so 70 newtons to the left. We can also calculate a resultant force when the forces are acting in parallel and they're acting in the same direction. So now imagine that you're pushing a box to the right with a force of 100 newtons, and your friend is helping you and pushing with a force of 60 newtons the box would move in the same way as if one person were pushing with a force of 160 newtons. So when forces are parallel and acting in the same direction, we add them together to find the resultant force. Here are four more examples for you to find the resultant force for. Pause the video and write down an answer for each one. So an 80 newton force and a 100 newton force together make a resultant force of 180 newtons to the right. 40 newtons and 70 newtons would be 110 newtons to the right. 35 newtons and 80 newtons would be 115 newtons to the right, and 50 newtons and 70 newtons would be 120 newtons to the right. Now, let's be honest, it's pretty unusual in the real world to have a situation where the only forces acting on an object are parallel to one another. It might happen if you have a stationary object where its weight is balanced by the normal reaction force acting on it, and then there are no other forces that are affecting that object, but in pretty much every other situation you're either going to have some perpendicular forces at 90 degrees to each other, or even forces acting at completely different angles. And it's still really important that we can resolve those into a resultant force, because by doing that we can predict the motion of an object and how it's going to move. So let's look at how we can do this for forces that are not parallel to each other. To take an example, let's say that you are sailing a boat across a lake from west to east, and the thrust from the engine is providing a force of 100 newtons. Now there's a wind blowing, 
and that's producing um, a force of 50 newtons that's happening at a 64 degree bearing, so sort of going across the lake. So the first thing we need to do is draw a scale diagram. So you need to pick a sensible scale for this, something like one centimeter per newton. So I draw a horizontal line representing my west to east thrust, and that's gonna be 10 centimeters long to represent my 100 newtons. And then I'd use a protractor and measure the angle, and then I would draw a line that was five centimeters long to represent my force of 50 newtons. The next thing I need to do is turn this into a parallelogram. So I've got my horizontal 10 centimeter line on the bottom and I need to draw another one on the top. And then if I join those up, I get a parallelogram. Now all I need to do is draw the diagonal across the middle. And if I measure the length of that diagonal, I can use the scale that I came up with at the start. So in this instance, 10 newtons for one centimeter to work out how long that line is and therefore how large the resultant force is. And so for this example, I now have a resultant force of 130 newtons at a bearing of 64 degrees. I can use the same technique even when the forces are acting perpendicular to each other, so at 90 degrees. In this example, my boat is still sailing with a thrust of 100 newtons from west to east, but now the wind has increased to 70 newtons and it's at a 90 degree bearing. Again, I start out by picking a sensible scale and drawing a scale diagram. So I've got a 10 centimeter horizontal line and a 70 centimeter vertical line. Next, I'm going to turn it into a parallelogram. Only because the bearing is 90 degrees, this parallelogram is actually a rectangle. Again, I draw the diagonal across the middle and then I can measure that using my ruler and use the same scale that I started with to work out the size of the force. So this line would be 12.2 centimetres long and therefore my resultant force is 122 newtons. I can then use my protractor to measure in the exam what the size of that bearing is. Now, because this is at 90 degrees, because these are perpendicular forces, it is possible to solve this question using trigonometry instead. So in maths, you should have met the idea of Pythagoras theorem which tells us that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where your c is your hypotenuse, the diagonal line, and your a and b are your vertical and horizontal lines. So I can work out by rearranging that, that the force is 122 newtons. And then if I wanted to, I could also use the inverse function of tan to work out that the angle was going to be 35 degrees. And that's the same angle that I would get if I measure it myself. For your physics exam, you're expected to be able to solve these with scale diagrams, not with trigonometry. But if you get the right answer with trigonometry, they will credit you. The only problem is that if you don't get to the right answer, you don't get the working marks for having drawn the scale diagram. The same principle that allows us to see how a pair of forces at an angle can be resolved into a single resultant force means that one force at an angle can be split apart into a horizontal and a vertical component. We're going to do this drawing another scale diagram. So in this question, you're asked to split apart or resolve a 2000 Newton force at a 30 degree angle into its horizontal and vertical components. To start with, I'm just going to draw a little horizontal line without worrying about how big it is and use a protractor to measure the angle. So here's my line and here's my 30 degree angle. Now I'm going to think about a sensible scale and I'm going to draw my diagonal. So before we used one centimeter for 10 Newtons, here it might be more appropriate to use one centimeter for 200 newtons. Now I'm basically going to turn this diagonal into a right angled triangle. So I'm going to make my horizontal line longer until it's the same lateral length as the diagonal. So they finish in the same position left to right on the page. And then I'm going to draw a vertical line that's going to be the same height. Now I can measure each of those and use the scale to determine their length. So my horizontal line is, um, comes out as 1,730 newtons and my vertical line comes out as 1,000. I hope this was a useful introduction to resultant forces and you're now feeling confident about going and attempting some more practice questions. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos about forces coming soon.